The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight, we continue our series of political debates, the 2021 Bronx primary debate series. Over the next two weeks, we're presenting debates in each of the borough's eight council districts, as well as the race for borough president, nine programs in all on BronxNet television. Tonight, we present five of the six candidates who are running in the borough's 15th council district, which includes the Bronx neighborhoods of Fordham, Mount Hope, Bathgate, Belmont, West Farms, Van Nest, Allerton, and Olinville. Tonight's program is presented in conjunction with the League of Women Voters, a nonpartisan political organization that advocates for informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major public policy issues. And also with CityLimits.org, an online news source for New York City that exists to inform democracy and equip citizens to create a more just city. Other sponsors tonight are Naleo, Dominicanos USA, The Bronx Times, the Norwood News. The Democratic primary is on June 22nd, and all eligible voters are urged to vote. The absentee ballot request deadline is June 15th. Absentee ballots must be postmarked by June 22nd. The early voting period is from June 12th to June 20th, and this is a ranked choice election, so you can indicate your top five choices on your ballot. For more information on all of that, you can visit vote.nyc. So there are six candidates on the ballot in this race. Five of them are with us tonight, so let's meet them. He served in the Service Corps working on participatory budgeting for the New York City Council and worked on criminal justice for reform and the My Brother's Keeper initiative in the Obama White House. We say good evening to Troy Blackwell. Mr. Blackwell, nice to have you with us. The incumbent council member is Oswald Felice. Council member Felice, nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you for having me. President of the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance and member of Bronx Community Board 11 is Bernadette Ferrara. Nice to have you with us, Ms. Ferrara. Thank you. Glad to be, glad to be here. The head of the resident association at NYCHA's Parkside Houses and an officer in the Citywide Council of Presidents of NYCHA's resident organizations. It is Lalith Lozano. Ms. Lozano, nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. The district manager for Community Board 6 is John Sanchez. Always nice to see you, Mr. Sanchez. Thanks, Gary. Uh, unfortunately, the sixth candidate, Aisha Bravo, had a schedule conflict, could not attend. You may find that both Kenny Augusto and Lachmi Devi Gopal will be on the ballot, but both have chosen to end their campaign. So they, of course, are not with us tonight. Candidates in tonight's debate, I'll direct a question to one candidate. That candidate will respond, and then each candidate will then get one minute to respond to the question before we proceed to the next question. All responses limited to one minute. Candidates will receive 30 and 15 second verbal time warnings. And then of course, when time is up and uh, the moderator, that's me, reserves the right to ask follow-up questions and also to allow for rebuttals and dialogue as necessary. Please note, no statement can be longer than 60 seconds. And we ask that candidates be respectful, not talk over each other, just raise your hand and I will recognize you. Uh, we won't have opening statements, but at the end of the program, each candidate will have the chance to offer a concluding comment. One uh, quick note before we begin, the questions on tonight's program include those submitted by the candidates themselves and also by our friends at uh, City Limits. So we will go in um, alphabetical order and rotate. Uh, everybody will get a chance to be first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And uh, right now, let's uh, start the um, questioning uh, with you, Mr. Blackwell. Uh, this is kind of an interesting district because it includes three of the 
so-called big four Bronx institutions, the Bronx Zoo, Botanical Garden, Fordham University, all multi-million dollar operations with national visibility that bring thousands of outsiders to the Bronx every year. The fourth member, by the way, of the so-called big four is Montefiore Medical Center, which is nearby in District 11. So here's the question. Do these organizations do enough for the Bronx? If elected and in conversation with one or more of them, what would you ask them to do differently or in addition to what they do in the borough of the Bronx right now. And that's for you, Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Gary. I think that the big institutions do uh, numerous work within our community, but I always think that it can go a little bit further. Uh, in particular, I would say that there are so many residents in the district who, you know, can't afford to go to the zoo. Many of them have not been to the botanical garden. Um, I think that there's a lot of work and partnership that can be done more with Monte Fury in terms of health issues, um, especially as we've seen over the last year with COVID, making sure that uh, minority constituents feel safe about the vaccine. So that's one area. Um, one thing that I think would be really interesting with the Botanical Garden seconds. Do is some members of the assembly have already started to do this, but maybe partnering and offering tickets to those, right? Give it as some sort of incentive for the community, especially as we are Fifteen. gearing back post-COVID. So that's my view on those institutions. Thank you. Uh, uh, Council Member Felice, uh, your thoughts on the, the big four or big three in this particular district? Yeah, they absolutely... Uh do a lot for our borough. However, I would absolutely ask them to do a lot more, not only when it comes to employment opportunities, but especially on education. Uh, there's a big problem in the Bronx with lack of access to opportunity and lack of access to good schools. Um, Fordham University, I think they should open their doors a bit wider for people in the Bronx. Um, you know, Fordham University has opened so many doors to so many people throughout the country and has helped them move up the economic ladder. Uh, given that they are located in the Bronx, um, I think they should do a lot more um, opening up their doors and making sure that people, young kids in the Bronx could also have access to that opportunity that they offer to so many people throughout the country. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lozano. Um, I've always supported all the institutions. I think they are a rich richness in our community. Um, they need to do a lot more. I would like to see a lot more more. Uh, window of opportunity of job opportunities, um, more education because, you know, our communities are impoverished. A lot of them don't even have never had the opportunity to visit our institutions. And I think it's vital that we do create more of an abundance of partnerships so they would have a better understanding of the community as well as we're getting a better understanding of them. I think it's crucial that one can do without the other. Um, that's pretty much, I mean, I, I really can't speak too much into it. I think 15. that they do a lot more, but you know, we have to work together. We have to work together. Thank you. I realized I went out of order already and I made a mistake. Ms. Ferrara should be uh, next. So, um, let's, let's do it. Um, Ms. Ferrara, what are your thoughts? Okay. Uh, I'm in agreement with everything that's been said so far. Um, the, the big four institutions have given a lot to, not only to the children, they have given a lot to uh, community boards. We just basically had, everybody just got free tickets for the summer um, from the 49th Precinct Council breakfast. Anybody who was there felt like I was on Oprah. Uh, but uh, I think what they can do is, is really do more for our children and the, all the different schools. There's so much, especially in the Botanical Garden, um, education, gardening, uh, teaching them how to grow things. I feel since we live in boroughs and not out in the country, that that's something that should really be worked on. Um, and also more employment. I, I know that they have a lot of the youth education, uh, but that's something that should be more of an outreach and be more abundant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now the final word will go to uh, you, Mr. Sanchez. Well, this is a great question. I think it's important for the next council member to already have these existing relationships. I've already worked with Fordham University and their students to provide free toys for youngsters during the Christmas holidays. Their students have worked with the community to provide civics workshops, resume and interview workshops. That needs to be expanded and the gates of Fordham University need to be open to the community, such as the campus of Lehman. When it comes to the Bronx Zoo and the Botanical Garden, 
We've worked with them in the past to help residents get jobs, but let's take it a step further. Why can't we dedicate some of the parking revenue that the zoo and the botanical garden get and keep that money in the community, whether it's for streetscape improvement or other community programs? That's the job of a council member. It's not enough to just to say, we need to do more. We need to lay out specifics of what these institutions can do. And the last thing is that these institutions should commit to a youth paid internship fair. Okay, thank you um, all the candidates for that. Uh, I think um, one of the beautiful things about that is visioning a new way of looking at the Bronx and the way of improving um, what we have and what we might be able to do. Uh, the next question, uh, we'll start with you, council member. Um, let's talk about poverty. The Bronx is the only county in New York State where most households earn less than $40,000 a year. About 30% of Bronx County residents live below the poverty line, which is the largest share of any of New York's 62 counties, unfortunately. Unemployment rate, 7.8%, which is among the highest levels of economic need in New York City. Fewer than one in seven residents has a college degree, well below uh, the uh, citywide averages. We're emerging from the pandemic, but the food lines are still long. I mean, I could list all of these things that you probably and all the candidates know them as well as anybody. Of course, no one here could think that any of this is acceptable and this has numerous implications on many aspects of life in the city's northernmost borough. So what are the issues that hold Bronx people back financially? And uh, if you are reelected to the city council, how would you address them? Yeah, poverty is caused by, by many different factors. Uh, one big factor is education. I attended Walton High School. I had, I was lucky to graduate from Walton High School in 2008. And I say lucky because most of my classmates actually ended up dropping out. The dropout rates in that school was at the sky. Um, and basically, that school was basically setting people up for poverty. We have to make sure that um, people in the Bronx get access to opportunity. Um, access to opportunity, there was actually a study conducted, I, I believe it was last year. Um, or actually, let's talk about the, the fact that only about eight to 10 African-Americans make it to the, to the Ivy League public schools in the city. Uh, there's a bad lack, lack of access to opportunity in the Bronx. That all has to do with education. If we don't have the proper schools, with the proper resources to prepare young kids for the future, we're, they're going to end up in poverty, and that needs to change. And I'm working around the clock to change that. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ferrara. Thank you. Well, one of the main things, if I get elected, is to really get the, the residents of District 15 and the small businesses back into the workforce. Uh, uh, one of, there's so many ways of doing this. Um, I want to see more opportunity zones uh, to promote new investment throughout District 15 to help our neighborhoods recover from the, uh, the long going effects of COVID-19. Um, and then when it comes to our education, we need more vocational schools. Not every child, not every adult uh, is college material or even wants to go to college because maybe financially they have to uh, provide for their family. Uh, so vocational schools, I, I have no idea why uh, that is not something that has been um, instituted years ago. Um, it, it just seems that like that idea with our elected officials that have been here, that that wasn't important. Uh, that is key, especially to us, uh, the climate of poverty that we do have here. And we need to have more incentive Time. for people to be off of unemployment and back into the workforce. Thank you, uh, Ms. Lozano. Um, I have to tell you, I've been doing this for 33 years. I've lived it and I breathe it and I see poverty each and every day. And okay, you know, we've gone through this pandemic. Since the pandemic, I fed over, over a thousand and plus people daily because I saw that they were out of work and they didn't have food. And yeah, we need opportunities for jobs and and to revitalize our businesses. But there are people out there that I know personally that didn't go, go to college and they have experience, trade experience to do things. Most of our elected officials that have been in place have promised us time and time again that they're gonna provide new initiatives to get, to get us going and revitalize our district. The truth of the matter is, is that still 15. at large, unfortunately, the 15th council district is impoverished. And, and we have to be a lot more open-minded 
to understanding and acknowledging it. But if you haven't been at the base of it, you're not going to understand how to improve it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanchez. Well, we have a great opportunity. We're going to elect a new mayor and that new mayor will take place, will take office in January. It's important to have a specific plan. Each council member gets millions of dollars they can direct to their communities. Right now, there are nonprofits such as the Knowledge House, Pursuit, Perscolis, that are providing job training and job opportunities for Bronx residents without college degrees in technology. If I'm elected, I'm gonna put more funding towards that. Also, what holds people back financially, childcare isn't funded. I'm committed to pushing the next mayor to ensure that childcare is funded so parents can go into the workplace instead of worrying about childcare. And then most of all, it's important that we we create an environment where there is enough housing for people, where they can afford that housing. That way they're not spending the little money that they do have mostly on housing. So it's multi factors to this, but it's important that the next council member has a plan, not speak in general terms. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Final word on this um, is Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Gary. Um, One thing that's central to my campaign and I always say is that education was my passport out of poverty. I lived in NYCHA. I grew up in public housing and with the help of amazing teachers, I was really able to make a career for myself. And what I think this comes down to is people are fighting for an opportunity and that opportunity is going to come through education and jobs. I think there's a lot of work that our public schools need. I know it's been touched on about the specialized high schools, about the gifts and talent, gifted and talented program, but this also comes through jobs. And one thing that I want to do is I want to see the CUNY Service Corps implemented here for the council member's office, the uh, upgrading, the installation of the retrofits that are happening in NYCHA in parks and houses. That should be going to those who live in the district. That should be an opportunity for those who are already here. So I think it's really about getting to the root of this issue, which again, it all comes down to giving people an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the next question. I think, um, Ms. Ferrari, you talked about small businesses in your last answer. So uh, let's uh, continue that dialogue. In its annual statement of needs, Bronx Community Board 6 said that the East Tremont Commercial Corridor has great potential, but the small businesses need assistance in getting organized to fulfill that potential. It noted that few owners have taken advantage of a 2011 rezoning of East Tremont Avenue. For example, it's been well noted that I noticed it very as soon as it happened that Frank Sporting Goods, a store that had stood and served the Bronx for a half a century, was closed this past fall. And that's just one example of so many of the difficult issues small businesses have faced. So let's talk about building East Tremont Avenue and other shopping districts in the 15th Council District. How do we do it? Well, I sit, I sit on the board of the Morris Park Business Improvement District. Um, and to be present there for our board meetings and also to have a one-on-one with the business owners and to really listen to the things that they are um, are in need of. And I think there are many plans that need to be implemented. They need to have resources. I think having a bid in any area does, does help actually um, make the businesses more prosperous. It gives them foundational, it gives them resources, it gives them money, it gives them opportunity for grants, it gives them loans, 15. it gives them so much and it's a group effort. And I think that is actually one way uh, to be able to start and, and start to work towards that and to make the businesses flourish and to stay, let make sure they stay there for more than a few decades before uh, centuries. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ms. Lozano, small businesses. Some people say they're the fuel that drives the borough of the Bronx, but many are struggling. Let's talk about uh, how to make them do better. I remember when I uh, started, I, I did work with the Fordham bid and I knew exactly what William, Wilmer Alonso, how exactly they created it. Um, there's a big problem, especially in this district. A lot of the small businesses don't, don't, um, no one has made an assessment, whether it's the New York City business, nor the Bronx overall economic, even the, the former borough president. They never reached out to, respectfully that I know of 30 seconds. in this district. 
So I think that it's crucial that we need to make an assessment of our small businesses in order to provide incentives for them to be able to help and assist them in revitalizing their business more importantly. And maybe eventually establishing a bid because it is important to have a bid in, in a business. I, you know, in my personal opinion and in my prior experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, small businesses is on the table for you. Yes, great question. And I've worked on this very issue. When it comes to East Tremont, I work with the Department of Small Business Services. They had a grant for storefront facade improvements and we were able to get $200,000 for businesses on East Tremont. The struggle was that the boundaries of the area were limited. We wanted that area expanded. Programs like that, funding should be increased. But also we have partners. We mentioned Fordham University earlier. They have a free program called the Metro Consulting Corps of students mm -hmm. that provide free consulting for small businesses. We need to utilize that. And then lastly, when we mentioned Tremont, it's important that we work with our state partners to ensure that the Metro North service is more frequent on Tremont so people are more willing to shop on Tremont if they can take a reliable uh, Metro North service. And lastly, it's important that we speak to businesses before introducing legislation. Too often the city council introduces legislation without keeping in mind what business owners deal with. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Gary. So with this question about small businesses, my stepdad is a small business owner. We own three stores in the Bronx and one of them is actually on East Tremont Avenue. And so first and foremost- I'll give you a chance. Do you want to say a free plug? Why not? Yeah, if you, any of you guys go to Jallo Fashions, there's three stores we have in the Bronx. There's one on Webster, one on East Tremont Avenue as well. I, um, think, I think that's fair. We give, I think all of us would agree. Why not shop there? Go ahead, Mr. Black. Yes, definitely. We won't deduct that from your time. That was my fault. No, thank you very much, Gary. And with that, so my stepdad hires locally. He pours money back into the local community. He's also very involved with the Muslim community here as well because he, he's a that's his faith. But I will say that the main thing that this comes down to is that people don't know the resources that they have. They don't know the, the, the abundance of resources. So I think it's really incumbent on the next council member, anyone who's in elected office, to make that outreach to these business owners because you talk to the business owners and they will tell you, I don't even know what this is. I didn't know I had this opportunity. Some things that I also think are worth putting on the table is let's talk about the commercial lease assistance program. 50. We know that there was a moratorium for personal renters, but not necessarily for those in, in business. So that's something that needs to be brought up to the table and multi-neighborhood district grants as well. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Felice, I was uh, made to understand that because of a committee meeting, you're going to have to leave us. Is Will you be able to stay or this will have to be your last answer here? Uh, this would have to be the last one. Yes, I have a 4.30 okay. commitment. So we'll, we'll give you a chance to talk about uh, small businesses. And um, then we do thank you for your participation uh, this evening. And um, uh, you know, we'll wish you good luck in the rest of the campaign. Thank you. Uh, so prior to running for city council, I had the honor and privilege of serving as a housing lawyer for Bronx Legal Services. Uh, Bronx Legal Services has a housing unit. They have over 100 housing lawyers. They also have a family law unit and a disability law unit. Uh, as council member, I'm going to be working to create, bring funding to create an additional unit, specifically a unit to hire lawyers to help our small businesses. Um, if you're a very, if you're a big corporation, you'll have money to be able to hire 20 accountants and 20 lawyers to that help you sense. navigate those very complex applications for grants, loans, and et cetera. If you're a small business, you don't have that same type of luxury. Uh, so we need small business uh, lawyers uh, to provide free legal services so that our small businesses can be able to take advantage of the many uh, different things that are available to them, including loans and applications and et cetera. Thank you, uh, Mr. Felice. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, Gary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great. Gary. I, yes. I have do you want to follow up? Please do. Yes. What I want to follow up is that um, we always hear, I'm not a career politician, I'm a grassroots kind, you know, candidate. And I get so sick and tired of hearing there's all these opportunities. I speak to all the local businesses since I've been running. None of them are even aware of any of the uh, opportunities out there. They don't have any resources, even when it's come to housing and it's come to everything else. 
And as an advocate, more importantly, I've been entrenched with all those things. And I find it a little disturbing when I have to hear um, individuals say that there, there's Very opportunities sorry. out there. Because if there were, we wouldn't be in the situation we are as it stands. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wants to weigh in on that before we move on? Okay. I would so, just second. Oh, sorry, Gary. I was sure. Just, no, no, please do. I wanted to second that. That's pretty much what my first point was, is that a lot of our small business owners do not know about the resources that they have. There's an abundance of resources here, but that's about constituent services, which is a big part of being a council member is your constituent services. How are you doing outreach to the community, to those stakeholders? And it's fine to say that all of these resources exist, but if no one knows about it and no one's taking advantage and no one's helping, especially if we talk about this district, uh, you know, the majority of small business owners here are minority owned and many of them are from immigrant communities. So making sure that that outreach is there is crucial before we go even any step further. You know, I'll go one step further for the other people who didn't uh, speak a second time on this. How, how do we do that outreach? Um, Mr. Blackwell talked about, uh, you know, constituent services. So uh, Ms. Ferrara, if you are a council member, uh, what method would you use to get to those business owners to let them know about these kinds of uh, benefits? Well, uh, one of the things I would do, what my plan would be, is to make sure that I know each one of those business owners and that they know who I am and that they have accessibility to me and to my office. That's number one. Number two, I will be listening a lot more because even as a grassroots person right now and as a board member, I listen all the time about um the, the small businesses, they should not be treated like the larger corporations. As said before, they don't have the money and seconds. the accountants. So they they need to be know what their resources are, what the and the, they need to know there's legislation that's going to go to them and say, you know what? We're not going to be putting all of those um, those so those uh, summons that you get. The businesses 15. should not be getting the summonses. The landlords should be getting the summonses, not the businesses that have the storefronts. I never understood that. So there's a lot of things I think need to be looked at so that they're they're handled correctly and they're given to the appropriate uh, resources. So that is shown support to them. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, you didn't get a second chance to chat about this, so we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to talk about how to do that outreach. Yeah, when we had businesses apply to the storefront improvement program, we went door to door, we held info sessions, but we also worked with trusted validators on each Tremont so those business owners could speak to their neighbors. I think most importantly, too often, the only time a business owner interacts with the city is when it comes to a fine. We need to change that and turn that around where we have representatives from the Department of Small Business Services touring these business improvement districts, these commercial corridors, letting them know, we're not here to find you, we're here to share resources seconds. and opportunities for you. I think that will be a game changer because we don't wanna associate the city with just being um, fined and punitive. We wanna show that the city can be helpful. Thank you. Let's go to uh, the next question. And the first uh, respondent will be you, uh, Ms. Lozano. Uh, on the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement have come anti-Asian attacks, anti-Semitic crimes against Jews, not to mention the rock throwing attacks on Bronx synagogues. How do we address these attacks on our fundamental rights and improve race relations in the Bronx for both the short and the long term? That's a very good question, Gary. Um, I have to say that as a, as a former uh, uh, president for the police service area eight. I came in contact. I, I remember that um, uh, we had a, we had a, a interaction when, when Diallo happened, when the Diallo case happened. And we had to speak to the officers so they would get a better understanding of how to reach out to the community. I think we need to go back to the fundamentals. There's bad apples in every profession. And not every seconds. officer is a bad apple. We have to go back and and when, when there was times that we had programs that improved community relations between the 15. community and the police department. We need to go back to that. We need to have a task force in each of those those um, those races that that we we all deal with, whether Time. it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's the Asian community, whether it's the Mexican community. Thank you. The only one that could see through the eyes 
and have been faced with prejudice and injustices have been those races. Thank Why you. can't we actually create a task force Got that it. they could be the eyes to be able to give understanding to the community, Thank to improve community and race Thank relations? You. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, uh, your thoughts on this um, race relations issue, both short and long term? Well, this has been an issue that our country has been wrestling with since its founding. But let's talk about what the city council can actually do. Well, the city council, we can fund programs such as what I've done at Community Board 6, where we sponsor open gyms for young people to keep them off the streets in the summer. That's a small effort that we can make. But also, I think it's important that we work with our state actors and push that repeat offenders, specifically repeat violent offenders, are unable to commit crimes again. I mean, we just saw this week a woman was attacked in Chinatown, and we found out that the perpetrator was arrested eight times for arson. I think it's important that our state really commits to funding mental health services for people that may need it but also not allowing these people to commit crimes continually on and on again. So it's a deep issue, Gary. It certainly is. Let's, um, nobody could deny, and that's probably why we've been wrestling with it, as you said, since our founding. Uh, Mr. Blackwell, your thoughts? Thank you, Gary. I mean, starting with this, we have to, again, go back to what the roots of the issue is, right? There's a rise in hate crimes for multiple groups, right? Racial justice. Um, but I think this starts by bringing multiple stakeholders to the table. This is something we did with 21st century policing and the Obama administration. I think it's about bringing those police community councils together with stakeholders from various different communities, leaders in the Asian community, leaders in the Jewish community, leaders in the black community, bringing these people to a team to be able to talk about some of the issues going forward. Talk about what is at stake. Because right now we are living kind of in two different dimensions. We're living in one world where some people are saying that there's an issue and then others are in denial. Um, if we look at the attack that happened in Times Square, I believe it was, where the, where the Jewish man was attacked, some people aren't even talking about that at all. It's been really quiet in the media. So again, we have to confront that there's two sides of this where there is hate that's living and breathing and it's Talk. acting out, but at the same time, there are others that are in denial. And as Lilith has mentioned, this is really on an intergovernmental task force. We have the DA's office, Thank the you. president and city council. Uh, Ms. Ferrara, you get the uh, final word on this. Oh boy, it's a mouthful. Let me tell you. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me tell you. First of all, I can't wait till we get a new mayor. And I think the relations with the new mayor and with our police department, I think need to be looked at, need to be uh, worked on. And I feel that that will bring a new new era of uh, working towards a positive thing. Um, also our um, a new governor. But uh, as far as with the mayor and what, what, what a city council person can do, that's most important. 30 seconds. What I will say is um, we are all, everybody in the Bronx, look at the color of my skin. We're all immigrants. We all have poverty. We all have uh, racial disparity. 15. And the one thing that in my community, in Van Ness, in Morris Park, et cetera, we work very closely with the police, with the NCOs. We get our community together. I will bring what we have successfully done and bring that to the rest of District Time. 15 because it is that important. And I will tell you that the what this Thank mayor you. has done to take away all of the tools from our police and to well, make them we're, we're, the, next, the next question is going to be about crime so we'll give you a chance oh, to thank uh, you. say those things. I will continue right. to be contingent. Right. We're, so let's see uh, Mr. Sanchez you'll get the first chance to talk specifically about crime. Let's talk about it. Crime is up, shootings are up, hate crimes are up. And there's been an out of control spike in quality of life, life issues like jet engine, like exhaust from cars that plague quiet Bronx neighborhoods in the middle of the night. Add to that, many Bronx communities have deep seated resentment of the NYPD that goes back generations. So how do we address criminal justice issues and at the same time regain community trust of the police and also keep police officers motivated to do their jobs? When it comes to trust in the police, it's important that the next mayor asserts civilian control over the police department. 
just today, an article came out talking about how the riots last year, the NYPD took four hours to respond to the looting downtown in Soho and that they neglected to protect the Bronx when there was looting in Fordham Road. We need a mayor that's willing to stick up, stand up to the police department if they're doing the wrong thing. On the same, on the other page, it's important that the council- 30 seconds. Takes a preventative measure. How do we prevent people from committing crimes? You know, we provide them opportunities, whether that's workforce training, workforce development, people that are released from jail and prison, making sure that the city funds programs so they can get back to work, that they can have housing, that they can have health care. We can't place barriers for people that get released and then expect them to be law-abiding citizens. So the whole formula needs to be changed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Gary. I just want to say that when it comes to public safety and it comes to police accountability, the the two don't have to be conflated. We can have police accountability and public safety at the same time. But I think that also starts again with an honest conversation, specifically in this district, right? Over a quarter of the students are facing homelessness. Gun violence is up. My in-law's family, somebody was a victim of gun violence in this district. So when we talk about what's happening, you have kids who are going home hungry. You have food lines that are long. You have young people who don't have the resources, but they're expected to show up and be their best selves. That's not happening. So they're turning to crime. They're getting in gangs. They're fighting over who can sell drugs on what block, and they're shooting at each other. That's why crime is up. People are fighting for opportunities. If we have opportunity... And we're able to give you know young people a recreational center, help people get jobs. The crime would decrease, but that should not take away from police accountability. The police have a very hard job to do. I've been black. I'm black, Gary. This is very Hi. personal for, for me, but I do want to say that if there is a bad actor and that actor is abusing their power, they deserve Hi. to be called accountable. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ferrara. I guess you wanted to talk about it before. The door uh, is open. Thank you. And you only have a minute, though. Let's be okay, clear. Okay, that's why I'm 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 uh, trusting. I'm I'm still reeling from what happened in my neighborhood last night. Okay, from a peace rally that was supposed to happen. Okay, and because our mayor has taken off any kind of safeguards for any kind of they don't nobody needs a permit, no for a sound nothing. And there were thousands and thousands of people disrupting my community, Pelham Parkway, Morris Park, Parkchester, climbing on lampposts, climbing on the bridges, taking their cars perpendicular to ongoing and on uh, in and go uh, traffic, okay? Jumping on cars, phone calls seconds. till the middle of the night, okay? This was supposed to be a peaceful rally for something. And speaking to one of the organizers that threatened us to say, this is not the best place for you to come here for that. Anyway, so the police cannot have to pick their seconds. battles. If they were well tooled, they know that they could actually be affected. So in my community, we don't feel safe. In all of the communities, we don't feel safe, okay? Because the police are being rendered ineffective. And so safe streets, that's number one that everybody is Time. looking for. We don't have it. Thank you, and uh, Ms. Lozano your uh, response to this. I just got to tell you that I bear witness in broad daylight a couple of days ago in a shooting corral right in front of my face and I had a duck for cover. So I I really was affected. And I want to tell you something. We have to end up cleaning our whole administration from the mayor on down. We have to have elected officials be held accountable with understanding the communities they want to protect and they want to serve. You know, a lot of them are not even community oriented to have an understanding of what it is to live in a, in a community that's impoverished, that is has no opportunities, that there is no accountability of, of police, of, of public safety and, and police. We're living right now since the pandemic in a lawless uh, uh, environment. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to make sure that before we come in and say, well, I, when I become the city council member, we're only one person in that, in, that Cong- in that delegation. We have to make sure that our mayor is going to be Hi. front and center to be able to know what the, what the issues are in order to affect change. So us as city council members Thank can you. affect the change. Uh, you know, 
Uh, candidates, you want to go around again on this question because it seems like everybody has something they want to say. So, uh, you know, I know everybody had something to say, but uh, why, don't, why don't we talk about it a little more? So, Mr. Sanchez, uh, do you want to weigh in on a, even another aspect of this? And, and let's talk about um, uh, making police feel safe uh, and, at doing their jobs and motivated to doing their jobs. It's something that we haven't uh, really talked about in, in that question. So let's give everybody another minute to do that. I mean, I think you know, police may not feel safe in their job. I mean, it's an unsafe job. That's important to, to note. Um, I think it's a tough factor. Um, I think when it comes to the police doing their jobs, they're able to do their jobs. I think uh, the I, issue is that- Let, let me just, uh, let me throw yeah, yeah. in the, the notion of qualified immunity. Do you support qualified, qualified immunity? I think qualified immunity needs to be rolled back. I think- an officer should not be given a shield of protection from harming people not being able to be prosecuted because they're an officer. So I support rolling that back um, because we've seen too many instances where that goes wrong. At the same page, one specific thing that the city can do to help with crime, you know, why can't we use some of the NYPD budget to fund security cameras for local businesses in our neighborhood? Put them in specific areas that are helpful to the businesses, but also helpful to commercial corridors. Also, why can't the city invest in lighting on our commercial streets? Lighting is a deterrent, and we shouldn't be begging the city to fund lighting in our neighborhoods to make us feel safe. So there's a lot of things that we can do, but we also need to get the state involved because the city council alone can't do it. A lot of the criminal justice reform depends on what the state does. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blackwell. Just uh, we've, we've thrown out a number of issues. Everybody seemed to have something more they want to say. Let's give everybody a chance to do that. Yeah, thank you, Gary. I just want to reiterate, police accountability does not take away from public safety. To answer your question, I do not support qualified immunity. I think it should be rolled back. I think it's a terrible uh, license to have. Um, the same thing with the vice squad. I think the vice squad has a number of issues and complaints in regards to racism and sexual assault and targeting. There's just so much that's going on there that needs to be properly evaluated. But again, we do need to make sure that our police have the tools that they need. But it's also understanding that we want to make sure that also the community feels safe. Certain communities just don't feel as safe because we ha we don't have the same history with the police. As a black person, I've been stopped in front. I've it. had people call me the N word who was an officer. So again, my experience and interactions with the police will be very different from someone who isn't, but that's okay. We have different lived experiences, but again, having public safety should not take away from police accountability. Ms. Ferrara. Well, let me ask you, let me ask everybody here, why is our budget and different things that we are talking about that's important? Why does it have to be taken away from the police funding? There are so many, other, you know, numbers are thrown in there. There is so much money out there. Things are allocated where we never thought that that money can be allocated. Why is everybody saying, well, we need to take a little bit from the police here so that we could get our community programs? I don't think so. OK, there are seconds. other places to do that. And as far as different things, I've been on the community board for over 12 years. I have fought for lighting. That's from DOT, MTA, different kind of city agencies. It takes a long time to get them to spend money. It has nothing to do 15. with the police. The police say, you, you need more lighting there, but it doesn't come from them. So when it comes to the police, there's a lot of things that we should be supporting with them so that they could be giving us more safe streets, not be wondering if they're going to get sued or if they have to get more insurance because they don't know if Fine. they get sued, if they could actually support their family on the salaries that Thank they you. get, which does not help me or you or anyone else in the community. Thank you, Ms. Lozano, you get the final word here and then we'll move on. They had, we had already taken $122 million from the police department. What did that achieve? I was on the local community board for 18 years and we talked to the MTA. They're the least city agency that wanna put out money for lighting in our communities at all. They don't wanna do any of that. I think that each department in the city, yes, we need the state counterpart to work with the city council. But more importantly, we need to start doing at least some investigation of each of the city 
agencies where they're wasting a lot of money that I personally call them pork bellies because that's what they are. If they want to spend so much on something that they find important and they make a distinct decision to say that this is important, then public safety in our local communities, then who gives them the right to do so? We should have a thorough investigation on every department and, and ask for an audit on their expenditures to, to know what we don't have to continue to waste Time. year after year. Thank you. Let's. Uh, these are all uh, somewhat interrelated, Mr. Blackwell. Um, let's talk about uh, one of the obvious antidotes to crime is uh, providing youth services that include productive activities outside of school, whether in the arts, athletics, educational enhancement programs, etc. But budgets for existing institutions and programs have been severely cut. The 15th CD is the Bronx River Arts Center, for example, which even through the pandemic and uh, now as we emerge has somehow been providing positive activity for young Bronx sites. How can we expand those opportunities for young people that will keep them off the streets, but also help them forge bright futures for themselves and their families? Is it only a matter of money or are there other innovations that can work? Well, that's a good question, Gary. I don't think it's only about money, but I think it's about taking advantage of the spaces that we do have, right? So when we talk about the youth, I mean, it's talking about summer youth employment. I remember when that had got slashed and there were so many people who were expecting summer jobs that did not get it. It's making sure that we have sustainable funding, not just money that's there and it trickles every year where it's debatable. We need to have sustainable funding for something like SYEP, right? Also the 1% for art change, which goes into to street art and public art funding. There's a lot of young people I deal with a lot of at-risk youth through church, and there's so many talented young people who are into art that they could be getting, you know, a summer job or an internship dealing with some of the graffiti cleanup or doing some public arts. There's also, this is where participatory budgeting comes in, right? There are council members who spend up to $2 million through the participatory budgeting project. There are young people who come out and vote on projects and say, these are certain things that we want in our community. For example, the Mary Mitchell Community Center. There are Time. I think we we'll get back to Mr. Blackwell in a minute. I think uh, we may have had a, a Wi-Fi issue that we could talk about the digital divide as well. Uh, nonetheless, yeah, froze. sorry about that. See, broadband is needed. Uh, that, that's an, uh, that's for another question that we could ask. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Ferrara, let's just talk about youth services. This has been one of, um, as a president of the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance and as uh, representing my community on the community board, one of the things that I have been jumping up and down and talking to our elected officials and screaming about, which is why I'm running for city council, is because we've got communities similar, Van Ness, Morris Park, Pelham Parkway, parts of Parkchester. There are no community centers. And I work with city planning and I'm like, well, what do you need for this? Well, show me a location. I get the location. Well, then talk to me about the money. So there's nothing being done. And I grew up in this community my whole life. And as I was growing up, there were no community center. There is no seeds being planted for programs, no boys and girls clubs, no, uh, no PALs, nothing. How is that with all the elected officials that they don't see that being important in our community? And trust me, I've been there for more than five decades. Thank Thank you you very much. Uh, Ms. Lozano? I would love to see, um, not to mention my age, (laughs) but I would love to go back to having and looking through the eyes of our youth, asking them, I know I see the talent out there. I've seen the artistry. I've seen their, their lyrical abilities. Why can't we just go back and, and ask them, Put, you know, when I make and I become a council member, I want to make sure that we have a youth from every part of our district to look through their eyes and ask them, what would they like to see? And bring it to our our, uh, state legislators who always say they never have money and and bring together back into time what worked. When you heard that, If it's not broke, don't fix it. Maybe we need to go back to that time because I guarantee you, Gary, we won't have so many, so many young people feeling bored to death and not having nothing to do. We just have to be innovative and look through their eyes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sanchez, final word on this question, sir. 
Well, this is an issue I've been working on since I've been at Community Board 6. We've sponsored open gyms for young people throughout the summer with a small budget for about $10,000. We sponsored open gyms for a whole year. At the council, we could do even more. In terms of locations, we have two prime locations that are owned by the city. We have Tremont Park, which is the old site of Old Borough Hall. I'm committed to turning that into a recreation center. We also have the old Fordham Library on Bainbridge Avenue. That's going through a land use review procedure seconds. right now. That should be a hub for young people to get jobs in technology, but also the arts. When we talk about the arts, I've been a great partner of the Bronx River Arts Center. And a lot of times the issue is just having a space. I was proud to have my community board office mm -hmm. be open for the Bronx River Arts Center while their building was under construction to provide these art classes. And I'm committed to doing the same in the council with a much bigger budget to have a bigger impact. Thank you. All right, this is uh, going to be, uh, you won't have enough time for this one either. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about housing. And uh, Ms. Ferrari, you'll get a chance to do this first. There are uh, a number of uh, proposed programs like Open New York, which seeks to increase upzoning for greater densities, raise height limits and reducing setbacks and streamline the approval prof process for social housing. The Bronx has also wrestled with different forms of neighborhood rezoning and development, like uh, the one on Jerome Avenue. Then, of course, there's NYCHA. The city has proposed addressing the fiscal problems and physical deterioration in NYCHA by converting all 178,000 units in the system to Section 8 and other voucher-based uh, funding mechanisms. So what plan or plans do you support to ease the housing crunch, to add affordable housing, and address the disparities in housing in the 15th Council District? Well, that's such, a, such an important thing, Gary. Housing. There are 2,150 NYCHA developments in District 15. And honestly, I feel that the mayor had put his money in an area where affordable housing, as important as it is, that the NYCHA development should have been looked at and the money allocated there before we went on to bigger ventures. But now looking back, uh, this is something that uh, moving forward, that uh, NYCHA needs to be looked at uh, they need to be, the, the areas, it needs to be fixed. The work ethic of how the funds are when working with NYCHA need to go back and be looked and re um, improved, okay? Because do, going back and doing the same thing twice is not gonna get better results. That's one thing. Going from low density to high density, I feel that I would not support that only because certain uh, certain uh, communities have a fabric that need to be looked at and up zoning, Time. down zoning might not work with them. So I think that's something that has to be looked at. Uh, and um, Thank you. Okay. Well, Sorry, we just don't want to run out of time and give everybody an equal shot. Uh, Ms. Lozano. Well, as a, as a member that represents 306 developments in the city of New York and 41 housing developments in Bronx North, I have to tell you that as a stakeholder, I've been sitting for the last three years fighting with four different administrations regarding NYCHA. We have investigated, we have requested forensic auditing because it's necessary. We know the agency is just using and want to convert Section 8, I mean, Section 9 to Section 8 because it's lucrative to them and they want to sell it to the highest bidder. 30 seconds. We're not going to support the blueprint for change because privatization is not going to continue to be affordable housing or public housing for residents. And anyone who supports it is crazy. We're going to continue to we're going to continue to fight the good fight. Fifteen. Because the truth of the matter is, is that there is no true affordable housing. When I hear a candidate and I hear an elected official say that I'm going to be there to support and be there for affordable housing, I've worked in the South Bronx in the state legislature, Fine. and I've seen people come out and they can't even afford regular South Bronx affordable housing. We have to make sure to say no. Time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Believe me, I'd love to give everybody more time, but uh, we do have a time limit on the program. Mr. Sanchez and uh, then Mr. Blackwell. When it comes to housing, it's twofold. The first issue is that we just don't have enough housing that's being built. In New York City, people think we build so much housing, but we build about a fifth of what we built in the 60s. So we're not building enough. And as a council member, I have an ambitious plan to bring 10,000 new units of housing to the district. And that means updating the outdated zoning rules that prevent housing from being built in the first place. 
buildings don't bring character, people do. And any limits on where people can live shouldn't be allowed. Another big thing that we have that can be underutilized, we have so many air rights that are available. Why not change the outdated zoning rules that prevent air rights from being sold from one block to another? Let's create a city air rights bank where the city can buy the air rights for nonprofits, places of worship, the MTA, et cetera. And then developers can purchase those air rights from the city to build more units in our city. We have to think big when it comes to housing. We need to build more housing, much more. Thank you. And the final word on this for you, Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Gary. When it comes to housing, people are struggling. Look, 41% of people are severely rent burdened. Over a quarter of our students, children are facing homelessness. When it comes to housing, I'll tell you, I do oppose Blueprint. I do not support RAD when it comes to NYCHA. I think we need to look into the city budget, at least at the bare minimum, 50 million for NYCHA repairs. Something that I'm really big on is the AMI. I think that should be based on zip code. I think that's how we are gonna get to real affordable housing. Something that I've been advocating since I started my campaign was talking about raising the market value of the city hubs voucher, which recently that just, there was articles that came out about the city council looking to pass that. That's where I stand on that. As far as new development, I think we need to repeal 421A, which is a tax subsidy, which does not benefit the people who are here. So I think if there's going to be new development, it needs to be done responsibly and it needs not to push people out. Thank you. Candidates, we're uh, just about uh, done with our program. Uh, I want to just go around the room real quick. Uh, You can just give me a couple of names. Um, uh, Let's see. uh, First, Ms. Lozano, who do you support for borough president and mayor? Uh, My partner, Fernando Cabrera. Okay. And that's for borough president. Uh, He's not yet ready to run for mayor. Who for mayor? Do you have a... um, I have to come out and say Eric Adams. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sanchez. Undecided about borough president, but Catherine Garcia is my top choice for mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blackwell. I'm still making up my mind on the borough president's race, um, but in regards to mayor, I'm leaning more towards Maya Wiley and Ray McGuire. Those are my top two. Okay, uh, Ms. Ferrara. Uh, as far as mayor, I am still undecided. There are many questions in my mind. Uh, but as far as borough president, Fernando Cabrera. There you go. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, we've asked this of all the, um, uh, the debates we've done, and many candidates are still up in the air. And in, in the mayor's race, that's really very, very unusual. All right, let's um, uh, do get ready for our closing statements. And uh, so we will um, go right in alphabetical order. And uh, that means you, uh, Mr. Blackwell, you can uh, take a minute and uh, tell us uh, what you think. Thank you, Gary. Troy Blackwell, I am super proud to be running for City Council District 15. We know that we are facing an economic crisis. We know that jobs are low, but elections are about a little bit more. We are also facing a moral crisis. And I think with some of the issues we discussed today, housing, gun violence, food insecurity, if these issues go unchecked, the Bronx will be the devil's playground. And that's why I'm running. I'm running because this is where I was raised. This is where, you know, my siblings, my sister is raising her son. I went to school here. My stepdad is a small person here and people need help. I'm someone who lived in dilapidated public housing. And again, with really great teachers, I was able to go to the Heights and work in the Obama administration. And now I'm running for office. I defeated all odds of what people expected of me. And I want every child in the Bronx to have that same endless hope and opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Blackwell. We appreciate your participation in this program. Ms. Ferrara. Thank you. My name is Bernadette Ferrara, and I am running as a candidate for city council representing District 15. I am a working class candidate from a family of immigrants. I'm a single mother with deep roots in my Van Est and other community roots. I'm a founding member of the Van Ness Neighborhood Alliance, and I've been its president since 2015. I sit on the board of Community Board 11 since 2008. I work on the Youth and Education Committee, Economics Committee, and Housing. I know what the problems are in my district, and I know how to solve them with common sense, practical solutions. I want to be your voice in city council. 
I know that what's important, economic stability, good schools, neighborhood amenities, and safe seconds. streets. My name is number one on the ballot, and I hope you will vote for me as your number one choice upon June 22nd Democratic primary. Thank you, Ms. Ferrara, and we appreciate your participation in this program. Uh, Ms. Lozano, your closing statement. My name is Delete Lozano. I am, uh, I've been working with the community for 33 years of my adult life. I've advocated for New York City housing residents all of my life. I've worked with state legislators. I'm privy to city and state governmental um, legislation. I have worked day and night to make sure to affect change. And I'm glad to say my record speaks on its own recondness. I was a former member of the community board on the housing committee. I was instrumental in getting a skate park right 30. on Bronx Park East. But I want you guys to know to vote for me and vote number one is a vote to persevere, to do bigger and better things. Everyone knows what I stand for. I stand for helping our community, public safety, job creation, housing, housing, small businesses, but just making sure that what you see before you is what you get. Time. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the final word of the entire program goes to you, Mr. Sanchez. Hi, my name is John Sanchez, and I'm proud to be a candidate for city council for the 15th council district. Less than 5% of people voted last time we had an election. Too often establishments from the political world try to push their candidates, but that needs to end on June 22nd. Our neighborhood and our community deserves more. Yes, I've done a lot of work at Community Board 6, the only community board with a year-round paid internship program, sponsoring open gyms. It goes on and on. But more so, I'm running for the people in my neighborhood that show seconds. the greatness of our district. I think of Coach Sean with the Bronx Steelers, who works three jobs, but volunteers every Saturday for hundreds of kids to play youth football. I think of Cookie from Murphy Houses, who checks in on all of her neighbors while dealing with two children that have health issues seconds. of their own. I'm thinking about Frank, who's lived in the neighborhood since the 40s, rents the Fordham students, but also stays active in the community. That's who I'm running for. And on June 22nd, I ask that you rank John Sanchez number one so we can make this the best council district in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Candidates, I know you don't agree necessarily on everything, but I know you will all agree that everybody who's eligible to vote should get out and vote on June 22nd. For more information on how to do that, it is vote.nyc. We want to thank our collaborators, the League of Women Voters. For more information, you can call the League at 212-725-3541. And also thank you to City Limits. You can find them at uh, citylimits.org. We also thank tonight's co-sponsors, Naleo, Dominicanos USA, The Bronx Times, and The Norwood News. We thank you for watching, and please make sure to vote on June 22nd. Good night.